Is the FDA covering its backside, David Challoner? Is that, no, that but that is the, 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 to make the question actually more, more serious and legitimate to what Scott was saying, he's, he's basically saying that, that the need for caution has just gotten out of control. That because more tests can be done, more tests are being, uh, more patients can be tested, more patients are being enrolled. And that the tolerance of being a little bit uncertain was greater in the past than it is now. And that that's a problem. I have trouble with that. Um, and I, the FDA is a public health agency. Uh, and the public health is a broadly considered uh, status of the general health of the public, some of which are at risk, many of which are not, and are treated with either drugs or devices. And I think that the FDA uh, is required uh, to look to the public health broadly in all of its decision making. Now, has it become bureaucratic? Have there been slowdowns? I mean, I, I think uh, my partner Jerry uh, mentioned that 50% of the salaries of the staff at the FDA who are looking at quotes, our public health, yours and mine, are now salaried by the industries that they're regulating. Now, somehow that doesn't smell right to me. Uh, I think there's a built-in conflict there, structural conflict, that the Congress has allowed uh, that we need to look at. Well, but we, we should, I mean, we should talk a little bit about medical devices as well here. Mm -hmm. right? a, lot of the, a lot of the problems that you talk yeah, about with medical devices are engineering problems, but your solution is more clinical data. And you're not going to be able to solve engineering problems with clinical data. You're going to need better engineering folks at FDA to Give look at those again, problems. Give me again a concrete example. Something like a, the, the, the lead for an implantable defibrillator snapping off. That's an engineering problem. You need to understand the biomechanics of that lead and when it's going to. In other words, you need to see if the device works in a exactly. lab. Exactly. Literally, put it in a company will sit with a tester and go like this with it 10,000 million times to see what it looks like. And but are you saying the FDA would not test it that way? FDA would test it that way, but, but the solution that you're proposing, the solution you proposed with the IOM panel was more clinical data for those devices. And I'm saying you're not going to ferret out those kinds of challenges. I mean, some of the challenges you talked about, maybe you would, but many of them you wouldn't. I'll give you another anecdote, the minimally invasive aortic, aortic valve. Right now, before a year ago, to have your aortic valve repaired when, when it became brittle, you had to have open heart surgery. If you went to Europe, you could get a catheter to insert a new valve uh, through a minimally invasive procedure, much like a cardiac catheterization. 30,000 Europeans had that valve implanted in them before it was approved here in the United States. It took us four years since it was approved in Europe to finally approve it here. And FDA was requ requiring companies to put it in pigs and sheep when there were thousands of Europeans walking around with it in their chest. Now, you explain to me why we couldn't learn more from those Europeans and the clinical data that was generated there than we're going to learn from pigs and sheep. And another anecdote. Wait, wait, it's a great question. It's a great question. <laughs> So, less is more. Stop when you're ahead, because I want to hear from the other. I want to hear from the other side. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. I think Jerry Avorn. Sometimes the Europeans get it right, and we get it wrong. Sometimes we get it right, and the Europeans get it wrong. There are examples in both directions. It is not the case, as the other side would have you believe, that the Europeans or the Canadians or the Japanese are always getting access to these wonderful new drugs years before Americans. We also have drugs that are approved here before they are approved in Europe and, and devices. But on devices, they are. I mean, the devices is different. They are getting access to devices before the United States, and medical device companies in the U.S. are moving to Europe right now because they can get approved there much faster than they can here. Let me, let me um, I want to move in two different directions. I'll tell you what they are now and we'll, we'll work through them. One is the, the, to the side that it's arguing against uh, the motion that the FDA is overly cautious. Your opponents have talked about the fact that people will die waiting for drugs because of this process and I want to put that to you. And then to the other side, they're, they've gone through a list of horror stories that are real and I want to, I want to hear your response to that. Um, first, to the side that's arguing against the motion that the FDA is overly cautious, um, they, they, they've laid out a pretty, pretty good argument that, in fact, the slowness of the approval process, which they say is getting worse and worse, um, means that people are, are, are dying when they could, if they could get into the trials, if they could get the drug released, put on the market, and whatever it is, the way that if they could get access to it around the testing process, that more people would be alive today. 
it, it, there's a logic to it, and I'd like to hear your response to it. There's a logic to it, but there's not facts to it. Why not? Uh, I think laying out a pretty good argument would require that there be data to substantiate it, and I think the data are pretty clear that we are not slower than other countries on Earth. On average, we are faster, and we have access to drugs granted in the United States faster than they are in other countries. Uh, and so while the concept of a bunch of pointy-headed bureaucrats waking up in the morning in Washington saying, how can I hurt people who are sick, uh, that's not the way the FDA operates. In fact, they are every bit as fast, at least on the drug side, which I'm more familiar with. Right, let's let the other side you respond know, to your claim that, in fact, the facts support their argument. It's that not a question. Again, we can't talk about review times and who's faster at reviewing applications. It's a question of development times, and you can't say that. To make that the distinction, please. Development times are the years it takes to go through those three phases of clinical trials you asked about. And, and development time. times are guided by the clinical trials that companies are forced to do. And the clinical trials that companies are forced to do are determined by what the FDA asks for because this is the biggest market. You can't develop a drug just for the European market. So if the FDA says that they want that outrageous phase three clinical trial that's going to take five years, the companies do it. And What's so the, the drug isn't available time? here or Europe. Scott, what is review time then? Review time is the amount of time that it takes FDA to actually review the application once it's submitted to the agency. So it could be six, right. as short as six months and 12 months in a standard uh, All right, cycle. now I'm following your point. It's, it's now I'm following your point about this distinction yeah. between development time and review yeah. time. So I want to bring that question back to you. They're, they're not talking about how long it takes for the paperwork to get done. They're talking about how long the company has to spend getting the drug to the point where they can actually present the paperwork. That, that process is the one that is, is bogged down in increasing, increasingly arduous demands to improve safety statistically. And that that's getting worse, and that as a result of that, people are dying. I think it is fair to say. Uh, D I'm, David I'm Delner. David, no, no, go ahead, David. All right, Jerry Avorn. Uh, uh, Jerry's better. OK, sure. <laughs> I'll do the drugs. <laughs> I'll do the drugs. I've been doing drugs for a long time. And David can do the devices. Jerry Avorn. Um, I think we need, we need to, um, first of all, ask, what are we keeping from patients? If to speak about this new TB drug, if I were a patient with tuberculosis, I don't think I would want to have accelerated access to a drug that quintuples my risk of death, doesn't treat tuberculosis, and then have to wait 10 years to find out if it really works. So um, a, dr a drug that is not- what if, you're, what if you're in a truly acute situation? You're going to die, and you're willing to try anything. That's a really interesting ethical issue that brings up the issue of lay a trial, which many people will have remembered. That was an extract of apricot pits, and a lot of patients wanted to get it because they had cancer. And back in, what, the 1960s or 70s, people thought that cured cancer. I don't think we should give access to treatments that haven't been shown to work to people however much they want it. Now, that may make me a paternalistic person, but if we go back to an era where anyone who uh, wants access to a drug that has not been shown to work can get it, uh, then we're back into the thalidomide But I don't era. think they're well, arguing a drug. Peter Huber, I want to bring you in because you've been very silent for the last few minutes, and, uh, and you, it's your turn. Um, um, I'm not sure that you're arguing that you want people to have access to a drug that has been shown not to work. No, right? not, shown no, 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 I actually, not shown to work, sorry. No, I, I, I want people to have an access to a drug where we've developed the science so well that we know it will work in that patient, not in the, uh, not, you know, the crowd that exists somewhere in, in the FDA's computers. And that requires the use of the very best tools of modern molecular medicine. And I ask you to think very carefully, where are they being used systematically, okay? They're being used after a drug gets licensed, okay? Under the FDA's yeah. standard protocols, we are not developing that science. We should be. It's the, the, I think it's almost required by law. The FDA doesn't license a drug. It licenses a drug plus a label. The label is saying it is safe and effective in these circumstances of use. And the FDA is not developing any of that science during the trials. It scripts every step of the way. The David one Jones. exception is under the accelerated approval rule, David. where it cuts out and lets the process and the science get done. <laughs> David Challenger. Let, let me step in on the drug side, even though I'm not as expert. Uh, when you, with some of these new, highly focused uh, therapies that are designed, specifically molecularly designed, for a very small group of identifiable patients because of something we know about their genes, those can be given on a humanitarian exemption. And the patients who are idiosyncratic and small in number can be dealt with by exceptions from the old uh, large population processes that we've been talking about. So it, it's not as if the FDA is standing in the way of the pro 
progress of Ameri modern American medical science because of the allowing some of these new and uh, 